Lord, as we, as we delve into the things that you put on my heart for today, Holy Spirit, my, I just ask you to move through this room. Do things I can't do. Do things my words can't do. Touch and open hearts. Set people free from their captivity. Heal wounds, both physical and emotional. Break off the power of the lies that we have allowed to live inside of us. You told us, you said in your word to the Apostle Paul that your word is living, it's alive, and it's active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword that it's able to pierce into the smallest places of division. You can go between soul and spirit. You can go between bone and marrow, that your, that your word gets to where it needs to go. And you told us back in the Old Testament that when your word goes out, it does not return to you void, but that always your word always, always, always accomplishes that for which you send it. Lord, I am putting my full trust and weight in your word this morning. Let everything that I have to say just wash away and be forgotten. But Lord, let your word be planted deep. Let it move with power. Holy Spirit, breathe on the word that's been planted in each of us. We ask for a harvest of righteousness for your name's sake. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to go to, we'll be in Matthew 28. We'll be kind of in a few different places today. Last week, I preached a, a, a hard sermon, a difficult word about counting the cost of being a disciple of Jesus. And that Jesus commanded us to count the cost. And Jesus told us what the cost would be. It would literally be our lives. That we would be called, if we were going to be his disciple, that we would be called to walk away from everything that was in him and choose Jesus as the one and only source of our lives. And I asked you last week to count the cost. And we're going to be talking today and to and next week about kind of the dimensions of that cost. What does it look like to be a disciple of Jesus of Nazareth, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of the living God, God of very God, light of very light, to give our lives to him and to follow him in the most practical terms possible. What does it cost? Because how are you going to count the cost if you haven't been told what it is? As I prayed about this, I felt like the Lord said, there's two dimensions. You're going to take, take two weeks on this, Josh. And I want you to take the first week and talk about what it means on the inside of a person to be a follower of Jesus. And then what it, next week will be what it means on the outside of a person. What changes does Jesus want to make inside of me? And then what changes does Jesus want to make on the outside of me? Heart 
and then hands. Because Jesus wants all of us. Let's go to Matthew chapter 28. These are very famous verses, verses 19 and 20. We call this one the Great Commission. That's what we call this. It was one of the last things that Jesus said to his disciples before he ascended. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Go, therefore, I'm reading it again. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. My goal this morning and my goal as the pastor of this church is to be obedient to that command that was given to me by my Master, my Savior, and my Lord, Jesus Christ. I am here doing what I'm doing now and doing what I do every day throughout the week to do this, to make disciples. That's my goal. I'm not interested in just converts. I've seen lots of converts made. I've seen that happen over and over again. I remember how many times have I been in a, in a service or in a place where, where the Holy Spirit is present and a preacher preaches a good message and then he calls for people to respond and be converted. And that's a beautiful thing when people raise their hands. And they pray the prayer after the pastor or whatever. And, yes, I'm going to. And they pray that prayer and the preacher says, that's great. You're now a Christian. You belong to Jesus. The problem is a lot of times, unfortunately, people think that was the beginning and the end of what it means to become a follower of Jesus. You are now a follower of Jesus. You don't have to do anything else. Congratulations. You've got your I prayed the prayer badge. So you have fire insurance and you're not going to hell. Isn't that awesome? That is not how this works. It's not. Did Jesus encounter them, forgive their sins, and make them his own that day? Yeah, he did. And that's awesome. But Jesus told me and told us and told his disciples, go make disciples. Of all nations. I have no problem with Billy Graham or Reinhard Bonnke or any of these. I love all of them. Praise the Lord for them and praise the Lord for the word that the work that they're doing. But if those people that raised their hand and prayed the prayer on that day don't be, then turn their lives and begin to follow Christ, well, they haven't done Matthew 28. Because it's more than that, to be a disciple of Jesus, to be a follower of Jesus, means that every day after that, after that beautiful moment of beginning, that every day after that, they're turning themselves, turning again back to Jesus, turning again back to that promise, turning again back to these things. And there is that second verse that we kind of run over, right? Because verse 19, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. Woo! And especially in the Assemblies of God, we love that because we are a missions-sending organization. That's why the Assemblies of God exists, by the way. I don't know if you're aware of that. The Assemblies of God became a denomination for one purpose only, and that was to raise money to send people to the mission field. There's people meeting, you know, and, ha and doing church, and that was all fine. But the reason they decided to gather together and become a group of churches was because then they would have the financial wherewithal to send people to the furthest corners of the earth. And now, today, 
the, uh, the, the um, uh, Assemblies of God is the largest missions sending organization on the planet. Isn't that great? That's us. That's exciting. Oh, uh, apparently not. Okay. <laughs> We believe in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. But we sometimes miss, especially here in our day-to-day, in our moment-by-moment in church, we sometimes forget verse 20. Teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. We believe in salvation by faith, by grace, through faith, for and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We're not earning our salvation here. But we begin to make our lives to allow the Holy Spirit to shape us into the image of Christ because that is what we want to be. We want to look like Jesus. Because Jesus is the best thing walking. And Jesus is, whether you understand this or not, or whether you've ever been told this or not, Jesus is. What he did was he came and he lived out and showed us the true way that humanity is supposed to operate. He came in our midst and showed us the reality of what God had in mind when he thought up the concept of human. That's what Jesus did. And what he calls us into is, out of all of the other things that we've been convinced it means to be man, to be woman, into what God's original intent for humanity was. That's what Jesus is calling us into. He's calling us out of all of these lies that we believe for so long about what our life should be for, about what meaning and purpose actually is, about what we should be doing, how we should be spending our lives, about what we should be giving every minute of our life to. There's a whole bunch of ideas flying around that you grew up breathing those ideas in and out because you grew up in a culture just like every other human being on the planet. And most of those ideas have nothing to do with God's original idea of what it meant to be a human being. We've talked about that a lot here. About God calling us into our true vocation, our true identity. Of God setting us free from all the things that war against us being what God created us to be. Y'all awake this morning? That's what Jesus did. And Jesus called us and he is calling you and me today. Follow me. And take up a different kind of humanity. And we refer to that as being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that begins on the inside. Begins in here. Because Jesus is not satisfied with changing your behavior. Now don't get me wrong. All of our behavior needs to change. (laughs) And we're going to talk about that some next week. But that's not enough. Because it's really easy, and the Pharisees were Jesus' perfect example of that back in the day. It is really easy to be Christian-y on the outside and have some really non-Christian-y stuff going on on the inside. Are you with me? It is easy for us to wear the, you know, the Jesus wear. You know, I still have my shirt, Jackie. Y'all need Jesus. I was wearing it walking in Pokegan the other day, and some guy, this kid, he looked like he's about 18. He looks at me and goes, y'all need Jesus. Yeah, we probably do. And I was like, I'd love to talk to you about that. He goes, yeah, see ya. It's easy to wear the Jesus wear. To only use Christian cuss words, hallelujah. To not smoke, not chew, and not go with girls that do. All that stuff is good, and you know, that's fine. Are you with me, y'all? It's okay. It really is. Darn it. 
It's okay. <laughs> but are we changed inside? Because that's where Jesus wants to start. Always. Jesus always wants to start in here and have what's real in here start manifesting out into the world. That's his goal. That's his plan. I want to change your heart and let your heart change your behavior. Because if I change your heart, your behavior will change. But if I just change your behavior, your heart might not ever be any different. Does that make sense? Okay. So what does Jesus want to do in our hearts? What does he want to do on the inside of us? My friends, it's super easy and simple, and we talk about it every single week. Matthew 22, 37. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. And one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with a question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus declared, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and all your mind. That is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Jesus wants to do in here. Jesus' primary goal, maybe even Jesus' only goal, the real goal of Jesus for your heart and mine, and what it looks like to become a disciple of Jesus is to become a person who loves the Lord my God with everything inside of me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet and to love my neighbor as much as I love myself. But Jesus took it another step further than in the book of John later on. Oh, a new commandment I give to you, he says, Love one another as I have loved you. Ooh, that's hardcore. I don't love myself all that much. So loving you as much as I love myself, that's easy. But when Jesus says, no, 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 let's go further. I want you to love each other as much as I have loved you. Oops. Oh, Jesus, that's asking a lot. Especially because immediately after he said that, he went and was nailed to a cross. I want to talk for a second about that, about this command. You see, that, that, that scribe, this, this law expert, he came to Jesus, and he was going to test him. They did this a lot with Jesus. They tested him. They did it for a couple reasons. One, you know, they wanted to know if he was the real deal. But two, they wanted to, uh, they wanted, they, they wanted to know if he was a part of their political party. It was all about politics back then. Boy, it's amazing how much things don't change. So one of the reasons this expert in the law, he was a part of the Pharisees, which was a political party. Didn't, did you know that? That the Pharisees were a political party? Yeah. They were the Tea Party of their generation. I'm not saying that to be facetious. That's true. They were hardcore conservatives. And that's what they wanted. And they sent their best dude, their best lawyer, their best uh, scribe, their best, most, the smartest guy. We need to trick Jesus into saying that he's a Pharisee. How do we do that? Because if Jesus is a Pharisee, then all these folks that are following Jesus are going to come over to our side, to our party, and then we're going to have a better place in the Sanhedrin. Do you see how this works? It's literally all about politics. And if we can get Jesus on our party, woo, it's going to be good. People are still trying to make Jesus part of their political parties. He won't have it. He wouldn't have it then. He won't have it now. But they ask him a really important question. They say, what's the most important commandment in the law? And you know what he says? He gave them the exact answer that they thought he was going to give them, but then he gave them a little more. You see, there's this prayer that... that Jewish people back then and still today would pray every single day, sometimes two or three times a day. Often it's the first thing that they say to their child after they're born. And, it's, and they often seek to, for it, this to be the last thing they say before they die. It's called the Shema Israel. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. That's, a, that's the first part of the prayer that they say over and over and over and over again. So, And that was the answer the lawyer was looking for. I'm going to test you, Jesus. What's the most important thing in the law? And he had that in his head. And Jesus brought it out, and they were, they were shocked because, you know, Jesus is tricky. If you didn't know Jesus is tricky, you haven't spent much time with him. He is sneaky, Jesus, sneaky Jesus. It's always good, but he can be a little sneaky. Anyway, have any of you met sneaky Jesus? I don't know. You guys are, are you awake this morning? <laughs> Jesus gave him the right answer, the answer they were looking for. They were like, Wow. Because they didn't think he would just come right out and say it. He's like, hey, he's a Pharisee. Like, that's why this is exciting. And then Jesus is like, ah. But the second is like it. What? Hey, Jesus, you were doing good. Just stop while you're ahead. Jesus says, da -da -da -da. love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, soul, and your strength. Yeah. That's number one. But number two, he literally says is of the same kind. Commandment number one is love the Lord your God, but commandment number two, ooh, they're right next to each other. It's of the same kind. And that one's love your neighbor as yourself. You see, that was Jesus' big problem with the Pharisees is they, they, had, they knew all about loving God. They loved to love God. They would make sure everybody knew just how much they loved God. They would go out onto the street corners and they would pray, Oh, God, I love it. Like, I'm dead serious. I mean, that was kind of, and they would make a lot of noise. And then they would, you know, take their huge offering gifts. And they were huge offering gifts. And that's totally awesome. And they would have a big band like, da, 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 da. Da, 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 as they were coming in to give to the thing. It's like, yes, yes, I'm going to give all this money to God because I love God. But Jesus was like, yeah, but you don't love people. This is a problem. You can't separate the two, and you're not, I'm not going to allow these two things, which are so important. They're of the same kind. They harmonize with one another. They exist together. And what Jesus wants to do, the goal of Jesus in your heart and in mine, and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus is so simple, but it's so radical. It is to love God with everything you have, everything you are, everything you do, and love your neighbor like Jesus loved you. I always tell the Lord, you know, commandment number one is pretty easy because you're pretty awesome. You know, Jesus is good, right? Do you ever meet people that it's like impossible not to love them? No, no one else has met those people? Okay. You know, you meet people that it's just like, how does anybody not love you? I mean, you're just amazing. My sister Brittany's right there. She's one of those people. She is, and everybody needs to meet her because... It's impossible not to love that woman. Anyway, I know I'm biased. She's my sister. But still, it's true. Travis, I'm right. Am I not? Yeah. That's her husband. He has to say that. Anyway. <laughs> she might beat him up. No, it's true. But there's those people that are impossible not to love, and Jesus is just like that. If you've had two minutes with Jesus, you love him. There's nothing else you can do because he loves you so much. If you've just spent, if you've got just caught a whiff of what Jesus is doing at any given time, at any point in time, you're like, wow, you're great. I love you. You're so good. I don't know how people hate Jesus. I really don't. Because he's amazing. I hope you agree with me. But loving people, <laughs> well, some people it's easy. Most people it's hard. Especially when Jesus puts that extra thing on it. Oh, love them like I loved you. Ooh. Okay. I can do it. The Apostle Paul, 
believed in this. He's 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm a ringing gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and I have absolute faith so as to move mountains but I have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and exult in the surrender of my body but have not love, I gain nothing. Do you see what he's talking about? Now, you look at those kind of things, and you're like, he's giving everything to the poor. He's surrendering his body. He is doing all these things. But if it's not real in here, you're nothing. Because love is more than action. It is action, and it requires action. It requires, like I said, behavior must change, but it's got to come from an internal shift. Jesus is not okay with just changing your behavior. He wants to change your heart. And to be a follower of Jesus is signing up to let Jesus change your heart. To shift you around so that the greatest thing in your life, the thing you love the most, stops being yourself or anything related to you and becomes God and everybody else. The center of gravity within us gets turned around and all of a sudden I'm more interested in what's going on with you than I am in what's going on with me. All of a sudden, I'm no longer thinking about how do I protect my stuff? How do I make sure that I'm taken care of? How do I keep, you know, you got to watch out for number one, right? No, in Jesus' world, ain't wrong. Number one is God and nobody needs to take care of him. And number two is everybody else. And so what do we do? We begin to learn how to love them. And it is about learning. We have to learn because we don't know how to do it ourselves. So how in the world do you learn how to love? Do we practice emotions? Okay, everybody, we're going to do happy now. Happy, happy, joy, joy, happy, happy, joy. Right? Can can you actually do that inside? How do you learn how to love? How do you learn? How do you learn how to love? It's got to be the activity of the Holy Spirit on the inside. But there are things we can do. So I'm going to give you three not quick at all and really not easy steps. I don't believe in quick and easy steps to becoming like Jesus because there's no such thing. But we are pointing at changing on the inside, and we are going to go through three steps to being transformed on the inside into a person of love. Are you ready? Step number one, allow God to love you. He already does. But this is it. Step one, open up your heart to the incredible flow of God's unstoppable love for you. Experience for a moment how high and how wide and how deep is the love of Christ. Catch a Catch a glimpse of the bonfire of love that is the heart of God for you. See, because this is what God's Word says. It says God is love. Not love and, not love plus, not love with. No, God is love. And 1 John 4.19 says this, we love because he first loved us. This is where it begins. It doesn't begin in all of my striving, I need to love people. Uh, does that ever work? No. It doesn't begin in a, in a mental decision. Okay, you know, last year my New Year's resolution was to lose weight. 
That didn't work very well. So this year, my New Year's resolution is to is 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 to love people. No, no, it's it, yeah. I mean, we need to be choosing. Probably, I need to be choosing both of those things. But we need to be choosing. It is a decision we make, but it doesn't begin with our own ability to love. It can't because our ability to love is stunted. Our ability to love is marred. Our ability to love is broken. Want to know why? Sin. In fact, that's what sin is. Sin is anything that's not of love's kind. And every single one of us have been exposed to things that called themselves love but weren't. Things that called themselves love but weren't patient and kind and all the rest of 1 Corinthians 13 that I didn't read you. But 1 John 14, 4, 19 says we love because he first loved us. Notice it doesn't say we love him because he first loved us. That was on purpose. If you read the context of that verse, you'll see why the answer is all of your capacity to love comes from your experience of God's love for you. I'm going to say that again. All of your capacity to love anyone, including God, comes from your experience of his love for you. Sometimes that's indirect. Like it's love that came from my mom. Well, who created her and put her in my life? My mother's love for me is God's love flowing through her to me. Does that make sense? And the place we begin to be changed inside is we begin by experiencing God's love for us. It is impossible to love without realizing and receiving God's love for us. There's this word that we use a lot that kind of has lost, in, in a, in, well, love itself. Love is a word that in a lot of ways has lost a lot of its meaning. In the Greek, it's agape, by the way. They had multiple different words that we all translate them all as love. And this one is the perfect, unconditional, divine love or agape. That's the word that Jesus used when he said, love your neighbor and love God. He used the word agape, is this divine, unconditional, I'm choosing to love you whether you ever love me back kind of love. That's, that's this, agape. And that's also the word that Paul defines in 1 Corinthians 13 as love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not arrogant, etc. Are you all with me? And that kind of love can only come from an experience of God's love for us. And then it overflows as God pours his love into my heart. It fills up my heart and then it overflows and becomes love for every single person around me. That's how this works. Do you want to know how to obey the first and the second greatest commandments? It begins here, and I can't say it often enough. Let him love you. But there's another word that is very, very connected and close to this. In fact, in the book of Galatians, as we've studied, the Apostle Paul says the new creation, that's that new humanity thing I've been talking about, discipleship of Jesus, that is faith working through love. Uh-oh. Do you know what faith is? Let me give you, that we have so many, so many different ideas around faith, and depending on what churches you've been a part of or what TV preachers you've listened to or whatever, you might have a bunch of different ideas about faith. But can we bring it down to its most simple, boiled-down place? Faith is trust. It's trust. And how is faith related to love? Well, you may know God loves you, but do you trust his love? Oh, yeah, I, I, I know God loves me. Yay, God loves me. But do you trust his love? Will you put your whole weight down on it? You ever had a chair that you weren't sure how it was going to do? 
I remember I was sitting at a 4th of July party one time, and the chair literally just <laughs> out from under me. And I felt like the fattest person in the history of the world because all the people laughed at me. <laughs> I'm not bringing a chair like that to our 4th of July party in the park. But this is what we do, right? I mean, when we've got a chair that we trust, can I trust you, chair? Can I trust you? I'm going to, so don't fail me. Okay. When we've got a chair that we trust, do we, are we, are we like, <laughs> no, we don't do that, do we? We just flop ourselves down. That's what I do. Isn't that what you do? This is what faith looks like, right here. My full weight, right here, in this thing. Why? Because I trust that it's going to hold me. And this is what it looks like to trust the love of God, too. I'm not questioning, do you really love me? Do you kind of love me? Are you really going to provide for me? Are you really going to take care of me? Can I really trust you? You see, this is why grace comes through faith. Because we can only receive the grace of God when we trust him enough to open our hands and say, okay, 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 okay. I'm going to trust you to love me. I'm going to trust that you're going to take care of me. Your and my biggest obstacle to being transformed into the image of Christ is simply this, trusting in God's love for me. That's the biggest obstacle you have. Because here's the truth. You know, Romans 14 tells us that anything that's not from faith is sin. That's what it says. And Do you know where all of your sins come from? Every single one of them? comes from some place within you. I don't trust God enough for that. I don't trust God enough to take care of me even though they reject me. So I'm going to tell them a lie so they don't reject me. Does that make sense? That was kind of a long thought. But that's how that works. Every single one of your sinful behaviors has its root in this. I don't trust God. To love me like he says he will. Like he says he does. All of them. Every single one. Because when I trust him to take care of me, I don't have to take care of me. He will take care of me. When I trust him to love me, then I'm not afraid to give everything loving you because he's already given everything loving me. And I know that he's going to fill me up or I pour out. Every single one of your sinful behaviors, all of them are rooted in this place of not trusting God's love. And the only way to uproot that is to surrender to God's great love. So that's step one. Step two, I know I'm out of time. We'll get these three out quick. Step two, allow yourself to love him in return. Step one is let God love you. Let your guard down, open up your heart, and let him love you. Just believe that he does and drop all the arguments that Satan's living in. Do you remember the other day when you did that? There's no way God loves you. Do you remember the other day? Do you remember the other day when you had this problem and there was no answer for it? That's because God doesn't love you the way he says he does. And it, this, is, this is who Satan is. He's the accuser, and he always he accuses God more than anybody else. And when we buy into his lies, that's when we start sinning. That's what happens. And what we need to do is begin to say, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. You are good and your love endures forever. Why do you think that that phrase disarms the enemy? Because the only thing he has 
is accusation. He's not good. His love doesn't endure forever. But when we choose to believe that God is good and his love endures forever, the enemy is out of weapons. As we begin to experience God's great love for us, to trust in God's great love for us. There is nothing you can do. You will begin to love him back. You'll just, without even thinking about it, oh, I love you. Oh. It's, it just happens. But it's still step two. As we begin to love him, everything begins to change. And the more you experience his love, the more you'll love him. Sometimes we've been so hurt and so beaten down that loving someone feels almost impossible. But let him win you over. You see, while you were a still sinner, Christ died for you. Before you ever thought about loving him, before you had one thought in your head about loving him or doing anything for him or being his disciple, he already loved you all the way to the cross. He already loved you through the grave and into the resurrection. He already loved you and he is seated at the right hand of the Father right now, saying to the Father, I love them so much. Wake them up to my love for them. Please, Father, by your spirit, open them up to receive my love. You know, he ever lives to make intercession for us. And as we experience his love, then we begin to love him back. And as we begin to love him, guess what? That's commandment number one. And don't put any barriers up to our love for him. Just go ahead and love him with everything you are. Just let it, let it rule every single part of your life. Oh, I'm going to spend time talking to Jesus? Yeah. I'm going to sing songs to him? Even though I'm not much of a singer, yes, please. Well, I'm going to go and do stuff that he wants to do because I care about him. Well, you know, when you care about somebody, you start caring about the things they care about, which leads us to step three. Begin to love others with him as a part of loving him. See, God isn't throwing us out there saying... Go love people. You don't get any help from me. Now, as we fall in love with Jesus by experiencing his love for us, then he invites us to partner with him in the stuff he's doing. He says, come on. Hey, I've got a friend. Let's go talk to that friend. Hey, I've got some people that I really love that they need a couple things, and you've got a couple things, so... Why don't we go take care of that together? Okay. Step one, love, let God love you. Step two, let yourself love God. And step three, begin to love others with him, in partnership with him. You see, his love for us empowers us to love him and others. And it teaches us what love really looks like. We've all experienced broken pictures of love, things that call themselves love, but are really self-seeking and destructive. But when God's love comes in, the pure, real thing of love comes in, he begins to heal all of our broken pictures of love. He begins to show them for the lie that they were. He begins to wash away the, the, the woundedness that follows after being loved. Or, you know, they, they said they loved me, but then they treated me like this, or they talked to me like that, or they made me do these things, and... They wanted to control me or they wanted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the ways that broken love operates. But when Jesus' true love comes in, he begins to just heal up all those wounds to heal our broken pictures of love and we begin to be able to love like he did. And when we're confused and when we don't know exac exactly what it looks like to love other people, then we just go back and we look at the way Jesus loved us. And we say, okay, so it's like that. Ooh, I'm going to need your help with that, Jesus. That's why he's here. That's why he's here, to help us. And this is what it means to become a follower of Jesus. 
we begin to love others as the overflow of our love for him. So back to 1 John 4, 11 this time, a little earlier. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God remains in us and his love is perfected in us. You see how that works? And then in verse 20, same chapter, verse 20. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he's a liar. (laughs) Oops. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And we have this commandment from him. Whoever loves God must love his brother as well. Let's prepare to take communion together. Can I get a few folks to jump over there and help us dole out communion this morning? Why do we take communion every week? Let me tell you. Because Jesus established this, this meal, as something his disciples would do. That ought to be enough. We don't need any more than that. Jesus told us to do it, so that's enough. But there's so much more, and it's this, and it has everything to do with what we've been talking about today. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Of what? What are we remembering? We're remembering the cross. And what is the cross? The cross is the greatest and purest example of how God loves us. See, when God loves, it looks like the cross. When God loves, it looks like the cross. co-suffering with us, stepping into the midst of our suffering and sharing it with us, forgiving us our sins, even as they nail him to the cross. What is he saying? Father, forgive them. And it's all love. It's all love. I heard a song one time that a guy wrote about the day that he got saved, and he's One line in that song has always stuck with me. It says, I heard your love song from the cross. Then I fell in love with you. We come to the table and remember the cross because right here in this little cracker and in this little cup of juice, we have the very real presence of Jesus reminding us of exactly how much he loves you and me. And we go back to this place over and over and over again so that we never forget. What it looked like when God loved you and me. It looked like the king of all creation, he through whom all things were made, stretched out his arms of love on the hardwood of the cross that all may come within reach of his saving embrace. So come. Because this is the table not of the church, but of the Lord. And it's made ready for those who love him and those who want to love him more. So come. You who have much faith and you who have little, come. You who have been here over and over again and you who have not been here long, come. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come. For it is the Lord who invites you. 
And it is his will that those who would meet him would meet him here. Let's take this cracker in our hands. Don't take it yet. If you did, Jesus forgives you. It's okay. He loves you a lot. I remember that this humble cracker was once a living stalk of wheat. Its life was ended and it was crushed and put through the oven to become this bread, which I will take into my body. So your body, precious Lord, was alive. And you were killed and tortured and maimed by men just like me. And you descended into death. But you came out the other side and were raised to everlasting life so that I could stand here today as a partaker of the divine nature. I receive your body, the bread that comes down from heaven. As I receive this bread to give me life everlasting. Amen. Now let us take it together. Hold up that cup. I remember that this humble cup was once a living vine which bore fruit. And that fruit was taken from the vine and crushed, and all that came from it is now delivered to me here. So your blood once flowed through your veins. It was taken from you by sinful men just like me and spilled out to begin a new covenant of which I am now a part by faith. And this blood is offered before the altar of God in heaven as an eternal testimony declaring my innocence, securing my resurrection, and completing my inclusion into the family of God. I receive your blood, King Jesus, as I receive this cup to give me eternal life and fellowship with you and with my brothers and sisters in this covenant. Amen. Let us receive it together. Let us stand. Precious church, may I bless you. I bless you in the mighty name of Jesus to receive the love of God. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family on heaven and earth is named that you would be empowered by his spirit in your inner man so that you would comprehend together with all the saints how high and how wide and how deep is the love of Christ. And that you being rooted and grounded in love might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do more than we ask, imagine, or think. Be all the glory in Christ and in the church. We pray amen and amen and amen and amen. I love you folks. Have a great day. Join us for some.